Thank you, Chloe. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Alex. I'm a senior lecturer in medical sciences, it says there. Um, I work in the College of Medical and Dental Sciences, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our um, teaching we do in biomedical science and show you how that links to research, because a lot of us are researchers and teachers on the course all at the same time. We just mix it up. It's really important to the university that we, we have research-led teaching, and in fact, and in fact teaching-led research as well. So I'm going to split my talk into two really. The first bit is some of the things that will be, um, my computer's trying to restart. My, the first bit will be about some of the teaching we do, broad brush strokes and how that interacts and how I find that quite inspiring really. And then the second half will be some of the research that my team's been doing and how that relates to some of the biology. Hopefully you'll be learning if you come and join us. Um, I really like it if you if you ask questions in the middle. It's quite difficult to do with Zoom. We could have a go. If if there's any questions about what I'm talking about, throw them up, and Chloe will interrupt if she can uh, if she can. Um, right, I'm going to. There we go. So I'm usually kind of asked to inspire people. Can you inspire people? I, I can't inspire anyone. It's embarrassing being asked. It makes me feel like David Brent if you try and inspire anyone. But I can tell you what inspires me about biomedical sciences. And it's this really, this guy. It's um, how it works. I'm really absolutely fundamentally interested in how the human body works, but also crucially for biomedical science, what happens when it goes wrong? And what do we do about that? big part of what we do and what we teach centers on that it also centers on this this pump here this is a human heart beating outside of the body with no neural stimulation that's important it's called automaticity i should probably give you a trigger warning about 30 seconds ago for that sorry if you don't like the gruesome stuff this is a fist-sized human pump beats pretty much every second of every minute of every hour of every day, if you're lucky without needing to be fixed and it'll carry on for nearly a hundred years. It's an incredible pump and it has to send five liters of blood around 50,000 miles of cardiovascular tubing in your body. It's an incredible amount. And it sends, every time it beats, it sends about 70 mils, half a cup full of blood around the body. And if I rip my heart out of my chest, threw it on the floor, it would send that half a cup full of blood, nine feet. It's really, really powerful organ. And it does that obviously to send oxygen and nutrients where they're needed in the body, a lot of oxygen to the brain. And then to pick up the metabolic waste, the carbon dioxide, and take that to be excreted where needed. Uh, a more useful schematic, perhaps this one here, you've got a figure of eight circulation system of um, blood from the pulmonary system, now with oxygen, goes, sends around to the body, deposits a lot of that oxygen and, and then gets re-pumped back to the lungs to be aerated in this figure of eight. And those up there on the right here, you can see actual real capillaries sending red blood cells. These are really small. If you're going to have 50,000 miles of tubing in your body, that's got to be pretty thin, right? And that, they're so small that red blood cells, which themselves are only like 10 nanometers, so a hundredth of the millimeter of a ruler, they have to squeeze up to get through the smallest capillaries. And all of this is there to oxygenate and fuel your body and to pick up the waste. Down at the bottom there, it says HR and BP. It's biomedical sciences. We're really interested in what heart rate means. If you hold up your, your hand there and just, just about there, stop pushing your fingers, you can start to feel a pulse. And through that pulse, if you count that for 15 seconds on your watch and multiply it by four, that's your heart rate. You're looking at about somewhere between 40 and 120 depending on loads of factors like um, uh, genetics is the main one actually and fitness and health and lots of other things. The, it says BP on the bottom, that's when you're watching Holby City or something, they've got two numbers. The doctor says, oh, this person's 120 over 80. What do those numbers mean? This is your blood pressure and those numbers determine the pressure in the system. And there's two pressures in the system. The heart is a pump with a tube coming out and a tube coming in essentially, figure of eight, but that doesn't matter. And when it squeezes, blood goes really fast. And when it relaxes, the blood's still flowing around because two thirds of a second later, there's another pump. It never has time to stop. That would be bad. It's medical biology. So the big pressure, the larger number, is the systole. The systole is the contraction. It's the systolic blood pressure. And then when it relaxes, there's still pressure in the system because it's about to pump again. 
and there's elasticity and lots of potential energy so it's still flowing and that smaller number the 80 is your diastole your diastolic blood pressure and they're both really important they can tell you different things about health and disease so that's what 120 over 80 means and they're measured in millimeters of mercury which is a really old-fashioned measure of pressure it's essentially the pressure you need to blow mercury the liquid metal up a little glass capillary tube and every millimeter every amount of pressure you need per millimeter you can measure we tend to use kilopascals for most of biology these days but for some reason with blood pressure we stick to that it's to do with proper doctors i think in the clinic point of this is to send blood around the body and that blood has to be oxygenated the point isn't really to send the blood it's to send oxygen where it's needed and we have to teach you how the oxygen gets in how that works what happens when it goes wrong and how it leaves again and a lot of what we do is respiratory physiology the most interesting bit for me is how if you imagine the lungs as balloons and you have to blow up the balloons every single time you breathe it wouldn't make sense to collapse them completely and then blow them up to their full five liters in actual fact that that doesn't happen. The reality is they're mostly blown up and they don't fully blow up to here. They don't completely collapse. They're kind of in the middle point and they just blow up like that. About that much air, half a litre of air comes in. Only about 350 mils of that is useful and that dilutes about five or six litres of air. So it never really, it isn't like all the air in your lungs is, there's no oxygen and then you breathe in and then suddenly it's full of oxygen. It's just slowly trickling in. The reason that the balloons are like the eyes Think about blowing up a really small balloon or a balloon that's quite stiff. And then it, and once it's done, then it's much easier to do a little extra. And that's what we do as well. We don't blow up our lungs every time. It would take extraordinary amounts of energy. It would make my cheeks hurt just thinking about it. Actually, it's already mostly blown up. So it's just that middle bit. It's a lot easier. And we'll teach you how that works, the mechanics of it, the physics of it, very much the biology of it, and why that's important. I'll teach you about chicken sandwiches. To me, that's not just a chicken sandwich. The nutrition and the metabolism, that's really important. What is a chicken sandwich? It's, it's bread and butter and chicken, right? And that's another way of looking at that is carbohydrates and fats and protein. When we eat these things, the carbohydrates form simple sugars, the, the, the fats form fatty acids and glycerol and the proteins form amino acids through digestion that we then reabsorb to fuel all of that system. And we'll teach you all about the metabolism and how, how you eat determines a lot of behaviours and how behaviours of your brain determine what you eat. Even by looking at that picture, I look at it now, even by looking at that picture, especially the chicken, just the mental state of looking at that causes the islets of Langerhans in your pancreas to start secreting insulin getting ready for glucose reabsorption. Thinking about it makes your brain release saliva in your mouth, which has the enzymes that start breaking down those sugars and those fats in your mouth, a little amylase, uh, lingual lipase. But interestingly, not the proteins. There aren't protein enzymes really in the mouth. That happens at the start in the stomach, but even more so in the small intestine, getting ready to reabsorb all of that into the blood to be used to make ATP for energy. It's not just about taking it on board, we've got to excrete it. There's a lot of excretory systems. I haven't got a graphic photo of that. Main one being my favorite is the kidneys. I spend a lot of time thinking about the kidneys. You've got about five liters of blood and this has to be filtered. And you filter about 180 liters of blood plasma every 24 hours, round and round and round and round. But I hope you're not excreting 180 litres of wee every 24 hours. And the reason you're not is because the vast majority of that filtrate is reabsorbed into the blood to make the blood, to make it the right saltiness, to make it the right pH, to make it the right balance, of, and the, make it the right volume as well. And then it excretes that 1%, the urea and the excess acid and anything extra it doesn't want, it will excrete that. But the reality is the kidneys are there to make the blood the right way with a little bit of excretion. And we teach you how that relates to all of the other things. As I think you can see, all of these systems are intercollected, inter interconnected, sorry. And they, and they have to be. Anybody on here do a bunch of drugs? Put it in the chat. By which I mean ibuprofen, paracetamol and so on. This is biomedical science. We're interested in why it works and what happens when it goes wrong, but also how do we fix it? Understanding these systems help us understand 
how the drugs work currently and how we're going to make new ones in the future and how you as the future scientists and clinicians are going to make new drugs in the future something that's really important and all of those drugs on all of those systems pretty much work on proteins these are small i can't say that clearly enough they're really small if i take your brain and make it as big as birmingham city center three five kilometers ooh, squeaky three or five kilometers there's hundreds of, of millions of cells each one now two meters high two meters wide the proteins that make your your cells run are still so small i could fit a hundred of them in single file across my palm of my hand they're absolutely tiny and drugs bind individual ones of those to stop individual things working which affects individual systems affects the heart and the brain and the lungs and the kidneys The proteins are coded for, as you well know, by DNA, and a lot of the molecular biology we do covers DNA and proteins. This is really important. And there is a lot of DNA. You remember I said that you've got 50,000 miles of cardiovascular tubing. Well, if I got your DNA and I put that end to end, it would leave our galaxy. It's incredible amounts of DNA, very thin and all wrapped up in your cells. But it's incredibly long. And this is so important for the core concept, the central dogma of life, that the DNA exists to code for mRNA and the mRNA codes to translate into new proteins that make us run. About 30,000. And that's what my research is in my team, understanding protein structure function. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that teaching has led to the research we do in my team and in the college a little bit generally. When I say my team, genuinely, I've got a team of people that are much cleverer than me that do all the work, really talented PhD students and postdocs that do a lot of the work. And I, I'm not allowed in the lab, they say, anymore, but I help them define their career paths and define the research questions they're going to answer and how they're going to do that. Research in general is a huge deal at Birmingham and particularly at the medical school. We've got seven research institutes doing all sorts of things from cancer to cardiovascular sciences, immunology and lots of other things. But I just want to point at the one at the bottom, Institute of Applied Health Research. A big part of our research is if you're not into pipetting and you don't want to be in the lab with a white coat all day, you can think about applied health research. How do we know? to define public policy after the coronavirus? How do we know that two meters is the right distance or we'll be wearing masks? How do we know to screen all women over 40 for breast cancer? Why not over 30? Why not over 20? All of this comes from applied health research. It's a very different way of thinking. You'll be exposed to this at Birmingham. It's a big part of what we do. But mine's very much the pipetting type of research which I want to talk to you about for a little bit. And I'm interested in this thing here, the brain. The human brain is, um, incredibly complex and I'm interested in how what happens when this goes wrong. The brain is made up of neurons as you well know. These are small but very long. They're everything you've ever thought or remembered, everything you've ever smelt or everything every time you've ever moved comes from the action of these neurons and you have a hundred billion of those in your brain. That's the same number of cells as there are stars in our entire galaxy. Coincidence? Yes, it is. And neurons aren't the only cell of the brain. About a third of the brain's mass are not neurons. They're the cells that surround and protect and feed and maintain the neurons, the astrocytes, the glial cells. They're called astrocytes. It literally means star cells, astrocytes. So they look a bit like stars if you squint. And the astrocytes are where my interests lie because they're so important if you bang your head or if you have a stroke because it's the astrocytes that swell up causing all the damage. I'm interested in brain trauma and the swelling of the brain that happens with brain trauma. The swelling of the brain is water entering that brain because the brain gets salty after a bang on the head. Actually, it's the astrocytes that get salty. They literally get a salt deregulation so they, they are saltier than they should be inside. And that causes water to move into them. And this is a very hard, very fixed volume, the cranium, a swelling brain isn't and that causes a lot of the damage after trauma and stroke and we're interested not only in figuring out that how that happens but stopping it happen this is a brain human brain 
And if you have that traumatic brain injury and the salt levels in the astrocyte cells, remember, they go up. If you remember, school was probably a long time ago for most of you, but if you remember salty, uh, nurse, if you remember osmosis, water moves from a low salt to a high salt environment across a semi-permeable membrane. Well, here's the brain and then the blood system separated by a semi-permeable membrane, the blood-brain barrier. If the brain gets saltier after an injury, water moves from the lower salt now, the blood environment, to the higher salt of the brain. And that causes all of that swelling that causes all of that damage. They used to think that this was somehow protective, like when you bang your knee, that's a protective swelling. Well, with the brain, it's not protective at all. It's bad and we don't want it. You can you think about it for yourself. If you have an accident and you bang your head, the last thing you need is a paramedic rushing over and putting a crash helmet on you. The damage is already done. We, this, this is um, a pathophysiological event that we're trying to stop. It isn't help, helpful. The water comes in through tiny protein uh, channels that look a bit like donuts, called aquaporin-4, and they're buried within the astrocytes of the cells, and they're absolutely tiny. My team are interested in the structure and function of those aquaporin-4 donut channels inside the astrocytes, how they move around and whether we can block them and therefore block the water coming in. Just to clear that up, you've got the big brain down at the bottom. Each one's got the hundreds of millions of astrocyte cells. And then each cell has hundreds of thousands of aquaporin-4 proteins that look a little, a little bit dark, like donuts that let the water in. So water comes into those donuts. Let's have a little think about water. Down at the bottom, you've got oxygen and a couple of hydrogens. But they're not in a row like that, like a TIE fighter from Star Wars. In fact, they're arranged more like the Starship Enterprise from Star Trek giving away my geeky secrets here. Now look at the top right, you've got oxygen and then you've got two hydrogens, a bit like the Starship Enterprise. That angle's all wrong, it's much more like that, but it didn't look as good with the Starship if I did it like that. And what that means is the electrons are much more likely to be over here by the oxygen than they are to be over here by the two hydrogen atoms. And that means as electrons are negative, this is, technically speaking, more negative -y and this is more positive what we call delta negative and delta positive. And that creates a kind of magnet effect with other delta negatives and delta positives. They can line up and form um, interactions and stick together. They can also, if you go over here to the, to the bottom left, this is my donut, a transverse section of the donut through the membrane. You can see this, the, the hole of the donut is here where water can come through. In the middle, of the, there's these positive charges that grab the delta negative, the negative bits of water, tear them off all the water molecules because they're all stuck together through surface tension. That's the proper word for this negative positive interaction. And then push them inside the cell or back out again, depending on where it's saltiest. So that's how they work. What we discovered in my team is that these aquaporin-4 donuts aren't just at the surface. This wasn't my team. We, knew, we already knew this, but they exist inside the cell as well. What we actually discovered was if you have a traumatic brain injury or stroke, the saltiness inside that pressure leads to a movement of these aquaporin fours out to the surface of the astrocyte to take on more water and cause even more swelling. We discovered that they moved and therefore more water can come in. Remember, that's a bad thing because we don't want them to move out to the surface. That's the moving out. We then discovered that there's a kind of a molecular ladder that moves them out to the surface and the nature of that ladder. But actually, they don't move up a ladder. As everybody who knows about biology will tell you, donuts don't have legs or have arms. They can't climb up a ladder. The ladder itself has to move. So perhaps a better explanation is it's a molecular elevator that takes the aquaporin-4 donuts from inside the cell and moves them out to the cell surface, particularly to the end feet where they touch the bloodstream to take on that water and it was this molecular elevator that we discovered in my team and the reason that's important is because if you have a traumatic brain injury we can't stop the water being there the extra water we can't stop the cells being saltier so we can't stop that if you're injured at the moment we can't we haven't got any drugs that will plug up the hole of the donut and stop water getting through if you have that brain injury although in my team we are looking for those but what we discovered is this molecular elevator that we can stop we have inhibitors of the proteins that are involved in that molecular elevator that we can stop. And that, we're hoping, is a new treatment for brain injury. Just to put, I'm going to show the actual data now because 
you're going to be scientists, you want to see real data, right? This is the real data from a recent publication we've had. That, it isn't a donut, that's it. There's four donuts. It's a homo tetrama, and each one lets water through. That's aquapoint four tetrama. Here it is in blue, ready to go up to the surface. That's the molecular elevator. So briefly, calcium comes in here. It activates calmodulin, a protein that lights calcium. It also activates adenylate cyclase to make cyclic AMP, a second messenger signaling system, which activates protein kinase A. Both calmodulin and protein kinase A directly interact with the aquaporin donut. And this moves probably through a reorganization of the cytoskeleton. This moves the aquaporin 4 donut out to the surface to take on that water. But here's the crucial bit, is if we take real brains, these are rat brains, and this is a normal amount of water in a rat brain here on the left. This one is how much water is in a rat brain after a spinal injury. And this is how much water is in a rat brain after spinal injury, after we've added our drug to the orange thing, and here, after adding our drug to the yellow thing, you can see that they're almost back down to uninjured levels. And indeed, eight weeks later, these rats could walk again, which we're really excited by. This led to a recent publication last month in a journal called Cell, which we're really proud of. And that is how our discovery of the molecular elevator we're hoping will lead to this drug going into man. This drug is one that crosses the blood-brain barrier because it was previously used for schizophrenia, but we want to use it for something else. So our next job is to try clinical trials to get this thing into people who are terribly poorly. If you've got any questions that we don't answer in this Q&A or you just want to uh, connect and say hello, contact me on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. Handle, is that right? Have I said it right? Please do. I'm always happy to talk about science with anyone. Thanks for listening. Chloe. She's disappeared. I might just start the Q&A on my own. Right, I'm going to do that because nobody's here. Um, The first question is, how much chemistry is involved in the course? It's a really good question. I'm introducing Andy Coney down at the bottom, Dr. Coney there. He's the uh, admissions director. I've forgotten your title. You'll agree with me that chemistry is a part of what we do. A lot of the physiology doesn't really use chemistry beyond probably GCSE level. We really use sort of A-level level levels of chemistry for the most part. There might be one or two things you have to learn. It's if you've got, you have to have chemistry A-level, Andy, to do biomedical